for this presentation, I would tell you to do something that my son taught me that you should actually tell, tell the people who are listening, is uh, pretend that you're getting on a roller coaster and strap on the safety belts. Because Carol Scavati is unbelievable. I uh, took her a project in 2005 about working with some students in Germany. She's taken that program, put it over the top, and now you have this amazing collaborative work that's going on between our universities. She did promise me that if we hum a tune together, she'll come dancing in onto the stage. And we picked CCRs uh, uh, right around the corner, right? So ding, 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 ding. All right, here's Carol Scavati. Greetings, greetings, thank you. Thank you, it is, it, boy, I can't, what a great group of sessions. And it seems like everything tied into what I'm going to talk to you about today. Collaboration, it's a real passion of mine. Uh, actually, I gotta tell you something, academia is a second career for me. I actually spent about 25 years in international business, international marketing. So this gives me the opportunity to kind of take my passion from my past to my passion of the present and take it into the future. So what's the most valuable asset that a firm has? Some people might say it's the technology that it has, the equipment, it might be the infrastructure, it might be the processes. Not even close. The most valuable asset that a firm has is its people. I know that's kind of sacrilegious for a marketing professor to talk about human resources, but it's true. When people get together, when people collaborate, amazing things can happen. They can solve the toughest problems. They can come up with the most creative ideas. New products, new services. Why, when they get together and it works, it's magic. It's absolutely magic. Now, how does this dovetail into what I do? Well, I told you, my passion is international. And we have folks around the globe. Even in our own institution, we are connected to so many different schools, so many different organizations all over the world. And we have the opportunity to learn with them, to work with them, to make something better. Now, the technology is there. And the technology is amazingly stable. Certainly better than it's been in the past. When I first did my, my first virtual, a multicultural virtual team, 1983, I was president of the Danish phone company. And it was a good thing that I was the president of a telecommunications company because the technology that we used cost millions and millions of dollars. Now, it's at our fingertips. Our laptops, our phones can connect us with people all over the world. The collaborative platforms that are available to us, many of which are no charge. So, what do we need to do? Well, what the heck, let's just plug everybody in and whether you're in Siberia or Sydney or Sacramento, you can connect and you can collaborate. Think about it. Just think about it. The greatest minds of an organization, location is no longer an issue because everybody, regardless of where they are, they can collaborate with each other. Man, it sounds like utopia, doesn't it? Outstanding. So, it's been going on for a long time. What typically happens when we have people from different cultures collaborate using these virtual technologies? <laughs> Boom. 
More times than not, it's a disappointment. And many times, it's an out-and-out out failure. You know, it would be so easy if we didn't have to deal with those people. People just kind of muck it up. But the reality is that it's people that make it work. Interesting study was published in 2009 looking at how the degree of distribution of team members impacted team performance. When you have the opportunity to be face-to-face, person-to-person, productivity is pretty good. But just move them around the building, move them to a different site, move them to a different city, move them to a different country, move them to a different continent. And you can see how the effectiveness and the efficiencies of the team decrease. So here we are, a paradox. We have all this great technology, and we just can't figure out how to, how to harness it. What are some of the problems that we run into? Well, one, the technical term of this is social loafing. But let's face it, we've all done this. When we're part of a group, sometimes we rely on the group members more than we should. We let somebody else do the work. But wait, what else do we do? If we're on a virtual conference call, oh, I see you guys smiling out there. I see those. You're, uh, you know that you do this stuff. You multitask. I must admit, I do too. I do too. Yeah, OK, true confessions. Yeah, we do other things. We're so easily distracted. But wait, there's one more thing we need to talk about. And that's the 800-pound gorilla in the room. I run into this every time I do one of these collaboration projects with our, our uh, sister school in Germany. And that is this issue of culture. Now, on both sides of the Atlantic, our teams, our, the, our people, our students are relatively diverse. Not necessarily all English and American and English speakers as they're, uh, as they're here, and they're certainly not all German there. So we have a tremendous amount of diversity in the teams that we work with with our, our multicultural collaboration. And what do I hear? Well, from the American side, I hear, ah, oh, those Germans, they are so bossy. They just think that they're responsible for everything and they're just going to take charge. And I'm not going to listen to them. And that's the guys. The Americans, what do they, uh, excuse me, the Germans, what do they think? Those Americans, they're so laid back, they're so lazy. They speak in tongues. They have expressions. And I have no idea what they mean. And they know but we don't. Just one example of what this little thing called culture can mean to virtual teamwork. It's tough when people don't speak the same language, when people aren't in the same time zones. It's really difficult to have successful collaboration, despite all the technology that we have. So how do we make these multi multicultural teams more effective? How do we make them work better together? There is a tremendous amount of advice out there. The research is loaded with it. Do the good stuff, don't do the bad stuff. Well, duh. <laughs> OK, I need to communicate. I need to listen. Uh, I need to be aware that somebody has a different culture. Whoopee. Tell me something I don't know. So let me share with you three pieces of advice for virtual teamwork 
that, that I've developed through the research that, that my team has been doing on this topic. The first thing deals with the organization and team complexion. This is actually the result of about 30 multicultural teams, student teams, that have worked on uh, our, our German collaboration, German-US collaboration. And what we have found, now, one thing I should preface this with is that not all teams are created equal. So what that means is that uh, there's differences in degrees of distribution. We saw that earlier in that research. Degrees of virtuality. Do they have a chance to get face-to-face -face, or are they doing their project completely virtual? Team familiarity. Do you know the people you're working with? Language, task complexity, a whole host of variables come into play when, it's, when you're defining what a virtual team is. So, what we've actually found is that we can reduce what are called the fault lines, the us versus them, if we have a moderate, moderate degree of differences, cultural differences. So, two Americans, two Germans, uh, a Norwegian and a Swede, uh, a Chinese and, and a Korean, Put those on a team, and that team will have moderate fu uh, function or moderate degree of, uh, of of heterogeneity, and it will function well. It will function well. But have all American or half Americans, half Germans, or everybody's from someplace else? They can't even figure out when they're going to make a phone call. So a moderate differences actually works best in teams. Another thing that has to happen at the team level is it has to develop its own culture. Everybody comes at it from their cultural perspective, their cultural bias, and you gotta throw that away, and the team has to develop its own culture. When is it going to communicate? How is it going to communicate? Who is going to communicate to whom? When are things going to be done? Don't ask somebody from Brazil, tell me when you're going to get it done because they're going to say soon. <laughs> and soon may be tomorrow or next week, you just don't know. The third advice, and this deals with the individual. It's important to have a buddy. And this is something that we've recently instituted with our cross-border collaboration project. So what we have is an American student who is paired with a student in Germany. And we try to keep them as diverse as possible. We make them buddies. They are responsible for each other, each other's work. If one disappears, we've got that guy from Greece that decides that it's Easter, and because it's Easter, he's going to disappear for three weeks. Well, that American buddy is going to know that, that uh, the, the Greek student has disappeared and is going to cover for them. There's a lot more that we have to learn about virtual teamwork. But suffice to say, we have the opportunity to put the world in our hands. The technology is there. And we have the cultural sensitivity to be able to get the job done if we develop cult, um, hybrid cultures within teams, if we structure our teams correctly, and if those individuals are really dedicated to getting the job done. It's a great opportunity. It's all at our fingertips. Let's put the world in our hands. Thank you. I was just wondering if you had recommendations for how, uh, kind of practically speaking, how teams should go about developing that culture that you talked about. Well, very good question. And in fact, one of the things that we do uh, in our, we have a very short period of time in which we need to complete our tasks. But despite that short amount of time to actually do the work, we dedicate two weeks right at the front end of the project. 
so that the team members can actually start to get to know each other. You can't work with somebody you don't know. And it's nice to know something personal about them. So there has to be, even for the short-term projects, some amount of time where the team members get to know each other, and then, and only then, can you start to develop what we call our contract. We call it a contract because the Germans are involved. But <laughs> it's a hybrid culture. Thank you, Carol. Very interesting research. I actually read some studies comparing Asian versus American, like teams, virtual teams, and that sometimes Asian teams can have members that don't see much just because that's the kind of nature of the culture and so on, where mm -hmm. they have good ideas, but Americans tend to just be so extrovert and so on. Do you ever find that? And Absolutely. do you have any solutions? What, what do you tell them? As a matter of fact, yes, we do. Um, there is, there's definitely differences in the way that different nationalities interact in a team setting. And one of the things that we do to get everybody involved is there will be, during our, our 45 minute to an hour long meeting, when we're doing virtual meetings, we actually have uh, interactive touch points. So there might be some kind of an exercise where everybody is supposed to uh, circle a picture that represents how they see themselves functioning in a team, and then spend three minutes, four minutes talking about it. The other thing, the buddy system gets everybody involved as well. So the, the, uh, the quiet, the, the more reserved, cultural background will have to speak up. And that hybrid culture actually, um, um, actually promotes that as well. Any other questions? I have one for you. Oh, OK. <laughs> so you're working on the ultimate challenge, right? Cross-cultural teams, yes. class projects. We hear lots of class projects which don't involve cross-cultural teams having challenges too. So some of your stuff applies to that, I'm assuming. Oh, of course it does. Correct. Uh, I, I use it in my undergraduate classes, and they meet in a classroom. Absolutely. And do you think the technology makes a difference? So for example, if you took your in-class projects here, mm -hmm. where geographically they're not dispersed, and they were to use technology, do you think that that's an interesting piece of research? Do you have any Ooh. thoughts on what could happen? Ooh. <laughs> That'd be cool. Right. That'd be really cool. We can try that next semester. There we go. <laughs> Actually, yeah, I think it, it would be a very interesting experiment. Uh, we certainly have the baseline for, for various team projects sure. that have been done over the years in class, and it'd be very interesting to, to um, look into that. Look into that. Oh. I hadn't really thought about that, but that, that's a good idea. Yeah, it'll be a good comparison. <laughs>